Right guys, this is Tom Archer, and this is what he can do. Right, Tom, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. No, we really, really appreciate it. Um, Tom has just uh, won a prize of the Astronomy Photographer of the Year, or runner-up in the Aurora category. Yeah, correct. We are going to, and this is why we've got him here, and obviously he is an absolutely fantastic photographer. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of his work. But before we start, do, Tom, tell us about you. About me, right. Think of it, think of it like it's uh, a photography dating agency. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, so I've been a photographer for, I mean, professional photographer for coming up 10 years. I was into it as an amateur for quite a few years before that. Um, and yeah, I started off doing weddings, which is obviously very different to what I do now. I still do some. Um, and I, I think it just slowly morphed into the different areas. Like I know we were speaking earlier about this, how um, you just kind of take what you get at first. Yeah. Uh, stuff comes to you and you see what you like. And um, yeah, it slowly morphed from weddings into doing some commercial work. I did some music and band photography. I got on to do a lot of property and architectural photography. Mm -hmm. um, but I always loved the travel and the landscape. Well, that was always my passion. I've always been really, you know, love travel. and. Um, yeah, I started getting an Instagram account that was growing more and more, and I got these opportunities come in to, yeah. you know, I'd always considered that I could never make money off travel photography or landscapes, and yeah. it is a very hard, very competitive field, obviously, but um, I suddenly I remember one day clicking and thinking, maybe I can do this, and, uh, you know, I'm going to put the effort in, I'm going to see if I can grow my Instagram account and put myself out there, and, yeah. and it slowly kind of snowballed and snowballed, and, yeah, to where I am today, where I get to do some awesome work all around the world, and, yeah, yeah I'm very lucky. And your Instagram following has definitely worked, hasn't it? Was yeah. it 130? I think it's about 132,000 at the moment, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that is very good going. And uh, check out Tom's Instagram feed if you haven't done already. Uh, it'll be coming across the screen and also we'll put a link in the description for people. Go and check his work out, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, so tell us about um, your, your journey from, have you got, did you go to university or did you just leave school and do this, that and the other? I mean, because People fall into photography in different ways, don't they? And um, and it's interesting to, see, and I, I know the audience would like this as well. It's interesting to see how you, you know, I don't know, left school or started work, and then now you're taking these fantastic photographs all around the world. You know, there's a journey there. Like, what, tell us about that. Okay, I'll, I'll rewind a bit more. Obviously, I told you roughly how I got into the landscape stuff, but how I got into photography. I mean, I've had quite a career change over time. So I didn't go to university. I was gonna go and study graphic design, which obviously ties into the creative artistic side of photography. Um, but I decided against it um, and I actually became a police officer, really? <laughs> randomly enough. I, I wanted to be a fireman, I loved the idea of that, but they weren't recruiting, so I went into the police. And um, I don't regret it for a second. I learned a lot and it was a fascinating job, but it definitely wasn't for me. And right. it's uh, obviously very different to photography. So um, they stopped giving career breaks is the reason I left. I, I just knew I wanted to travel and see more of the world and on an extended kind of backpacking trip. Yeah. Um, so I left after just, uh, just under three years in the police um, yeah. when I was 23. And I travelled for two and a half years, and I'd, I'd been into photography before that. Um, my parents had bought me an SLR one Christmas, and I was out taking photos of flowers close up, and yeah. you know the kind of things you do when you get into photography, yeah. just anything you can really. And yeah. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I travelled, and I took an SLR with me, and I just really loved the travel photography. Like I had a passion for those kind of. Uh, at first, it was actually partly about people, which is funny because I don't do any of that really anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just really enjoyed it and I kind of learned as I was going along and read magazines and yeah. started reading things online. And when I came back from traveling um, with a broken leg, unfortunately, it yeah. kind of forced me to come home. It's, yeah. I think it's funny how all these like little events yeah, can really exactly. change your life. Yeah, that's right. It sounds like you've been, your hand's been forced a few times. A little bit, yeah. yeah. I really, you know, if I hadn't have broken my leg, I think that I could possibly still be living in South America. I really wanted to live out there. I love yeah. the language and the culture. But yeah, I came home and I thought, right, what about photography? I want to be my own boss and I love photography. Like, is this something I can do? Uh, which is when I started out with weddings because someone I went to college with was a wedding photographer. And Alex Beckett, who's also an incredible photographer, he's from Colchester, um, right. like top wedding photographer. So yeah. he kind of taught me a lot that I, I know now about flashes and lighting and sort of the professional side. Yeah. Um, and that 
merged on, like I said earlier, into the commercial work and the travel work, and yeah, so it's been a bit of a journey. It snowballed from there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I certainly weren't expecting you to say the police fall, so I know that much, but, uh, but it seemed to have worked for you eventually. Yeah. Eh? Um, Tom, let's have a look at some pictures, shall we? Yep. Uh, let's go straight into some pictures. Now, I've picked one here that I would love you to tell us about. That one there, I think, is an absolutely fantastic photograph. It's, it's, like, it's like Mad Max, isn't it? It's like, you know, the apocalypse have come and then yeah. there's this person trying to find people to survive that's what it looks like to me yeah. um go and tell us uh, tell us a story behind yeah, it yeah i mean it is a surreal place and i think a lot of my like landscape work when i travel to places I, i'm just googling i'm looking through any website i can 500 px in, in you know, instagram wherever um just google pictures trying to find interesting places and this one came up when i went to dubai with my wife last year um that no, was this year actually yeah. it's weird how time <laughs> how time's gone this year yeah um so I, I found this place with the sand over the road and I thought, is that actually a place that exists? Like, how does that even work? Yeah. And uh, I looked into it and it took a while to find out where it was. And it turns out it's outside of the city of Dubai in the desert. And they built this whole grid of roads. Yeah. It's a bit surreal. It's yeah. like it's like they expected it to be this huge development with, I don't know, shops and, you know, like a whole new suburb. Yeah. And then just nothing's happened to it. So this is perfect roads and yeah. they've just let the sand drifts across and there's nothing to sweep it but um, we went out there um, just got a taxi out there and had a walk around so that's just one of grid 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 like it goes yeah. on and on and yeah. the roundabouts are covered in sand is it a, is it a drone shot yes yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's not very high up but from the ground you can't get much to get that kind of yeah. you can't see the yeah. Um, but yeah it was all kind of like <laughs> you know it's a real place like wealthy people with their toys like there's all these people out there on like quad bikes and motorbikes and which obviously you can't see in that it's such a huge area that you don't but you can hear them in the distance and people flying model airplanes and it's almost like this kind of playground for yeah. people to come out of the city and um, you picked a bit of a naughty one I have to be honest because the skyline is like that but it had to be kind of slightly enlarged so uh, I tried to be honest when I posted that and say yeah. that one's slightly manipulated but you know you can see the skyline like that um, yeah. it's just been moved across and enlarged slightly to kind of get the atmosphere of what I felt when I was yeah. there and um, I read, uh, yeah, I read the the uh, what you wrote about the because it, yeah. it's the skyline's kind of photoshopped in or, or enlarged, like you say. <laughs> what, what's your thoughts on that though? Because I, I, it didn't bother me once mm -hmm. I, I read it, and there's not not once did I think, oh, that takes away from the shot. I never thought that once. But I know some people actually do think. What, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I have mixed feelings. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I, for me, it's just about honesty, I think, as long as you're yeah. honest. Like, people have always created art, and, yeah. you know, when people painted paintings, a lot of the time they'd say, right, this is a painting of this, and this is how I saw it, but they painted in a, a perfect sunset that wasn't there, or, you know, it's artistic license, I guess. So yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with manipulating photos, because people always have, from yeah. paintings to the first, you know, people think film wasn't manipulated, but it was massively yeah. in, in the... Yeah. Uh, in Lightroom and, and photography was years ago when it was even in yeah exactly I've seen some fascinating old um, sort of blogs about um, some album covers I remember there's one about Bob Dylan and there was an example of the photo that had been printed uh, like developed and then someone had gone with markers and told them what to remove in the yeah. photo so get rid of that fire hydrant get rid of this yeah. brighten that and it's like wow it was actually the same as it is now people don't realise it just had to be much more skilled back then to know how to do it and, yeah. Uh, so yeah I don't see a problem with it I think as long as you're honest and for me a lot of the thing is um, creating like an atmosphere around a place of exactly how I remembered it, yeah. how how it felt to me to be yeah. there. So with this shot, for example, you could see that skyline, but it was slightly off to the right, so it wasn't yeah. quite in the straight line of the road. Yeah. And I could see it like that, you know, to your eyes, but to, to kind of blend it in and, and yeah. get it looking right, how I remembered being there, I had yeah. to play with it a little bit. Yeah, but it certainly works. And um... Andreas Gursky, the photographer Andreas Gursky, he manipulates his photographs mm -hmm. uh, and, he, and he freely admits it. But he says that he has to manipulate his photographs to make them more truthful, right? <laughs> and, and it's a really interesting thing, yeah. especially when you look at his pictures. Um, but, and it's, this is kind of like what you're saying mm -hmm. here, isn't it? Like you've manipulated it to make it look like how you wanted it to feel or how you thought it looked at the time. Mm. Um, no, I, I, don't, I think it's a fantastic picture. And obviously uh, your wife there, if she weren't there, it just wouldn't be the same picture, would it? Yeah. 
The only thing that bothers me really slightly is that at being a perfectionist is that she's off centre. But at the <laughs> right. time, she was a long way away and I couldn't shout to her yeah. and we didn't have that much time and battery yeah. in the drone. And it's hard to see the drone on the, on the phone. I guess I could have photoshopped that across yeah. like just I did with that. I probably should have. I look at it now and I'm like, oh, just wish I had a moved. <laughs> no, brilliant. So, Tom, looking at your work, and we've obviously touched on it a little bit, um, I've seen wedding photos commercial photography, landscape photography, um, travel, uh, adventure. There's, there's lots of different photographs that you that you take. Now, the photography world out there, they want to pigeonhole people, don't they? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you, know you want to pigeonhole you in, in one thing, but obviously it doesn't work like that. But so what I'm interested, I'm just interested in how you how you deal with it. Right. And where do you see yourself in the photography? world? And is it the fact that, no, I will do lots of different things or I see myself as a you know what do you know what I'm trying to say like have, have you um, have you come across it as being a problem that that you've got so many different avenues that you go down no I don't think so at all and I, I really like that, that old adage uh, variety is the spice of life I really believe that I think like even though I really love travel and landscape photography if that was all I did it would be hard because as much as I think this is where people play a little violin for me like as much as I love traveling uh, it's hard being away constantly. Like you have no life at home and you're missing out on what's going on. And you know, my wife's at home, I can't leave her constantly. It's a bit unfair on her. And yes, it's amazing. I get to do some amazing things, but I don't want to be away every week or even every other week. Like yeah. I'm happy going away maybe once a month for a few days. Uh, it just depends on the year, but, uh, but yeah. And I think also if you just do a little bit of everything, it just keeps things more interesting and keeps yeah. your creativity. And um, so, I, so if someone said to you, uh, Oh, Tom, what type of photos do you do? You know, generally, you know when you meet with someone and, they, yeah. and you go, oh, do you, I'm a photographer. Oh, what do you do? What type of photos? That's what generally what people ask yeah. you. What would you sort of say? I think I'd mainly say I do a bit of everything. Yeah, yeah I'm just yeah. trying to, I guess it depends who's asking, if it's in a business sense or if yeah. it's just in a, yeah. if they're just interested. But yeah, I see myself as doing everything. And I know that I'm kind of known as such for my landscapes because I've got a big following on social media. So. Yeah. That's how most people that don't know me personally would be like, oh, he's a landscape photographer. They yeah. wouldn't even probably know that I do yeah, weddings. Exactly. And I do occasionally get messages of people saying, oh, I really love your stuff on Instagram. Do you do weddings? And I'd be like, yeah, I've actually got another website exactly. for that. And yeah, people don't realize. But yeah, um, yeah I definitely think I'd rather keep it open. And yeah. it's good then because you get more work coming in. You can pick and choose what you what you like if you fancy yeah. it at the time. Yeah, no, I, I think so. And I totally agree. But you will see on, on the Internet and on blogs and whatever that people say, you know, you just do one thing. Yeah. Well, actually, your Instagram feed is probably um, a good example of that because it, it might be so successful because there's only one kind of uh, genre in it, but you as a photographer do several different things. Yeah, I definitely think that's right. I think that, like, if, if I posted weddings, commercial work, and travel photography, I think that I'd have photographers following me. Yeah. That want it. But I don't think you'd get average people following you. And that's yeah. probably why I've got such a big following because people love travel and they want to see those beautiful landscapes and they want to learn of you know where to go next in the holiday and they save them and, and people yeah. message me and ask, oh, where's that hotel or where's this? And yeah. so, um, yeah, I definitely think that helps for a following. But yeah. um, No, that's great. It's a, yeah. it's a great answer. And it's, it's something that I'm interested in actually because you know I, I, I do all lots of different mm -hmm. things and my Instagram feed is, is not... Um, it's not consistent like your. I literally have got pictures of documentary yeah. stuff, landscapes, portrait. It is a total mix, yeah. and um, and I and I do think that you you're more successful on Instagram if you are in one kind of uh, sort of niche. Um, but you shouldn't limit yourself to that, especially commercially. And mm -hmm. I, I, I just was interested in it, and hopefully help people out that are budding photographers out there sure. as well, yeah. I think it depends on what you're using your Instagram for, right? If you want to use it to show your portfolio. Yeah. Like mine would not be effective if I want to get loads of weddings or commercial work because a lot of people would just disregard it and say he's a travel photographer. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, it's helped me to get more followers and helped yeah. me to get more work within that. So yeah. yeah, it just depends what you're after, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about your photograph that was entered into the Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition. So um, this was taken in Lapland, Finnish Lapland. Um, it was yeah, January last year. I went over with a friend who's also a landscape photographer with just, you know, just a photographic holiday of us just to uh, go out and see what we can get. Um, yeah, this particular shot was taken. So we were staying in a, a resort called the Inari Wilderness Hotel, which was kind of out in the middle of nowhere a bit. We stayed in one of the um, 
you've probably seen them going around if you're on Instagram a lot, the glass kind of um, igloo type buildings where you yeah. can see the Northern Lights. It was kind of a, one of the versions of them. Um, and we were popping out and waiting for the Northern Lights because I mean, the Northern Lights are quite elusive at times. Like you can, you can be somewhere for two weeks and not see them, but um, it just depends on what you know or how lucky you are. And yeah. um, what we'll often do is actually look for a forecast and go last minute. So it's like, oh, they're, they're yeah. going to be strong next week. Let's see if we can go away, if yeah. you've got the capability. Anyway, so we're out, we're waiting. The Northern Lights started to come out. We went out, but it was incredibly cold, even for like Lapland standards. It was getting towards the late minus 30. So I think it was like minus 37, yeah, that's quite cold. something <laughs> like that. Yeah, I'd never experienced that before. Yeah. And actually, um, you know, I'd experienced minus 20, which is very cold still, but you yeah. don't realize the difference between minus 20 and minus 35. Because I think to your brain, and if you're not used to that, you're just like, if you're in the minuses, really you're in the minuses. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but I mean, we're talking like cars freezing over, cameras stopping working. Yeah. Um, so I think I could, I was actually amazed by how well my camera did. Yeah. It was out for over an hour before it started to freeze up. The shutter would literally yeah, start yeah. to click and yeah. you take your uh, gloves off your hand and it was just painful. It's dangerous, obviously, for frostbite. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I remember actually touching my face to the camera and it burnt the skin on my face because yeah. the metal on the camera was so cold. So, yeah. um, But anyway, the, this northern light started to um, form and, and we were really lucky with that shape, obviously. It's a bit, people describe it as a bit Star Trek-esque or something, yeah, you know? It's yeah, like, yeah, um, yeah. So that came out and I found this this tree um, and I just thought it would be perfect and luckily I was yeah. <laughs> I was very lucky with the way the Lawns of Lights formed behind it and created the shape and yeah. uh, because of the snow and I think I mean I was asked this a lot before I can't actually remember but I there's a lot of light in the scene and I think it must have been the moon yeah. a, a bit of a moon to create that kind of what, what was the exposure time um, I, th I think from memory it was about 10 to 15 seconds right. yeah very wide aperture yeah f2.8 normally yeah. on something yeah. like this uh, yeah. very wide angle it yeah. usually is 14 to 24 millimeters so super wide angle lens yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the aurora and the night sky yeah. and the wind must have been still yeah i think it was really still yeah. um and it all just fell into fell place into place and i got a lot of exposures of that tree of the northern lights changing but this one with it kind of yeah. cutting through it's almost like a knife blade or something yeah. isn't that big machete or something yeah, it's cool. uh, it just worked really well yeah. and, and yeah. Is it, do you do you just do like what's the process in just lightroom or it depends on the shot um with this one i think it was just yeah mostly lightroom just a bit of brightening up and colour balancing. Yeah. Um, I seem to remember that there was a thin fence on the right hand side and I think I got rid of a little bit of the fence, just yeah. being honest about that bit of just yeah. to make it nice and neat and tidy. But I left all the, you can see all like, the tyre tracks of the cars and yeah. all the snowmobiles yeah. that have been going past and because yeah. I wanted it to look kind of authentic. I didn't, uh, it wanted to look at like an adventurous place that people are uh, yeah. out and about exploring. Yeah. It's, it's a fantastic picture. It's very calming, isn't it? I mean, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't think it was minus thirty or whatever it was. Yeah, <laughs> that's the yeah. first thing I said when when it won the award, and they asked me to talk about it. It was like, what was it like? I was like, I know it looks really calm, but it was actually kind of painful yeah. almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a fantastic shot. And I tell you what, it brings me on to our next question. Yeah. Your your kit actually, and I, I know it sounds. I, I just know that people love to hear that, right? Yeah. People love to know what other photographers use as their kit. So. Tell us about your kit, you know, what do you like using? What's your common sort of setup, if you like? Sure, um, well, I'm Nikon shooter. Right. Um, my main camera for this would be a Nikon D850, which is ideal for landscapes, because it's a really high resolution, 46 megapixel, I think, or 45 point something. Right. Um, it's got a great dynamic range, so it really retains like highlights and shadow detail. Yeah. Um, and I have a range of lenses. I'm, I'm not much of a prime shooter, I have to be honest. I prefer yeah. like the zoom lenses, so I've got the, Holy Trinity, as they call it, which is a range of the 14 to 24 millimeter wide angle, 24 to 70 mid range, and 70 to 200 zoom, and, and between them, that's all I need. Yeah. Have so that's you, you. That's in your backpack, and you're yeah. gone. Yeah, because it gives you, you know, you can do anything. And I think prime lenses can do have their uses, and they're, they're great, especially for portraits yeah, or when you want to get that um, fast, you know, shutter speed yeah. and you low light. But in the landscapes, you've got a tripod with you. It's not yeah. so important. And yeah. uh, the negatives obviously are that they're very expensive to have those three, especially for an amateur. Like, it's a very expensive range. Yeah. And they're heavy to yeah. carry, especially if you're hiking up the top of a mountain. Sometimes I'll pick and choose and I know what works. Yeah. but. Yeah, um, yeah. depends on the environment you're in. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. I appreciate right. that. And uh, it's always interesting to know actually what, yeah. what, uh, what people use. Okay, Tom, I want to talk about another picture now, sure. if you don't mind. And it is this one here uh, with the sheep. And 
it stood out amongst yeah. all of your photos. Still, they're all like as a great shot still, but uh, yeah, I liked it. It just looked fun, if you know what I mean. And um, and I just wanted to tell us about it, if you don't mind. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, this was taken in the Faroe Islands, right. which. Uh, uh, way up north, kind of above Iceland and Scotland, yeah, a small right. set of islands, yeah. and yeah. they're not very well known, but um, they, they're becoming they, they, more they, known. Owned by Denmark, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's quite a, a surreal place, and it's just incredibly beautiful. It's a, I would say it's a bit of a mixture between Iceland and kind of Scottish islands, like yeah. in the landscapes, and yeah. lots of different islands with bridges and roads like driving between them. Yeah. Um, I was out with another photographer again, and we were working with the tourist board, just kind of creating some landscape photos of the place. Yeah. Um, and this, I think, this is a perfect example of why you should always go out, even when the weather's bad, because the weather was horrendous. Yeah. In fact, it was a lot of the time in the Faroe Islands. Yeah. Um, it was just absolutely chucking it down with rain and there's this viewpoint near here called, I think it was called Funninger, which looks down onto the fjords yeah. and it was in the other direction and we stopped the car and you had to walk across a load of fields full of sheep to get there uh, and it was near sunset and it must have been, um, yeah, we just we're, we were contemplating not even getting out of the car. We're like, this yeah. is we don't want to walk through that. But oh, no, I've been there loads. Of, I, I yeah. think I would call myself a fair weather photographer yeah. these these days. <laughs> yeah, but you know what it's like I anyway. Like. But I just we like you know we've got to. We're here, so yeah. we went out. We got drenched, um, and 20 minutes later, this the sun came out, and this happened a lot of times in the Faroe Islands. Actually, and I think when you're on a, an island like that, you get the clouds forming above the island, yeah. but often out to sea, it can be clear. Yeah. And once the sun gets low enough, it comes under those clouds yes. and creates this incredible light. And yeah. the some of the light we saw there, but um, in regards to the sheep, loads of the sheep in the Faroe Islands just run away from you. As soon as you get near them, yeah. they just sprint off. They're really timid. Yeah. But for some reason, these three guys, I presume they're a family, is that yeah. a, a, this baby kind of there yeah, with its parents, I don't know. Mom, mom they just, baby sheep. they followed us around. At one point they were like running after us when we ran across the field and I was a bit freaked out like, <laughs> is it? But they were just really curious of us. It was the first time it happened out there and they, it, yeah, it was like the pose for us. And everyone kind of jokes with this, that it's like a family portrait, right? Yeah. Like it's like they're sitting there posing for yeah, a, it looks like um, it, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I was really happy with that too. It's like kind of that perfect light mixed with them posing yeah. in that perfect shape for us all together. One of them moments where it just all comes exactly. comes together, yeah. yeah. The 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 sun the sun setting just just on the edge of the uh, of the mountain yeah. there as well, all at the same time. You yeah. know, moments like that don't happen a lot, do they? No, and I think people don't realise that like, they look through my portfolio yeah. and they're like, I either think I'm really lucky or I can control it. But yeah. I sometimes would do like a whole week of yeah. just photographing all week in an amazing place like this and I'd come away with like one or two photos yeah. that I'm happy with. Yeah. And I think a lot of amateurs don't realise that. They, yeah. they're like, why can't I do that? And it's like, it's, it's actually, it's commitment, isn't it? yeah, it's time. It's yeah. commitment, yeah, definitely, 100%. So, but, uh, no, it's a fantastic shot. It was the, the processing of it, because mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes, because you can, you can add that light. I know it's not yeah. added, as we just spoke about it, but like, because yeah. um, it's just, the, all the colours, they all just mix lovely. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And uh, so, so tell us what did you did post-processing to this shot, if anything at all, no? Um, yeah, I think again it was it was general kind of balancing of colours, making sure like the the kind of greens of the um, fields and stuff came out right because it can be hard to balance in certain lights between yeah. the green and the warms and the. But I didn't do a huge amount, um, maybe a bit of um, playing around with the sort of dodging and burning because when you get light like this, sometimes you get very bright bleached out sun and very dark foreground yeah. or whatever so I can't remember that well but I it looks like the kind of image you'd have to kind of balance out a little bit yeah. I generally don't do multiple explosions and blend them together I think yeah. because the Nikon is so good yeah. I usually try and shoot for a kind of mid-range exposure and then I know that I can pull that back and yeah. so it's a bit do you, of do you use filters as well for for the sky and, and things like that or no I'm not a very traditional landscape no. photographer I very rarely use filters and I, I get it but um for me, like, are you talking about gradient? Yeah, gradient? like a grad filter, or just if yeah. you've got a bright sky like this, would you put a soft grad in or anything like um, that? The reason I don't is because I gen when I've used them before, I find that obviously if you've got, it's perfect if the horizon's perfect, but when you've got those shapes, you end up with a dark bit of mountain. And because I find cameras are so powerful now and I yeah. can do it post-process, um, it gives me more control. So yeah. I just take a load of frames, darker and lighter ones, and then I just try and blend it later and yeah. um, so that I don't, otherwise I can spend so much time on the technical side of the shot that I miss the composure or yeah, okay. something else. So, um, but yeah, I think, okay. Okay. Um, and, and regarding the flare and the light, I mean, obviously it was, it's waiting for it to be perfect and yeah. taking loads over an hour. But um, one thing I do with the, to get that perfect flare is I often like, 
when it's on the horizon like that, I'm kind of squatting down, standing up and just kind of taking yeah. loads because sometimes it'll flare too much sometimes and it's getting that perfect yeah. balance of flare when it comes over. So yeah. and I it, think that helps. Well, it, it certainly worked. It certainly worked there. Uh, I, I love it. I love the shot. So I've got a philosophical question for you now, right? right? <laughs> We're going to get deep. Um, what is photography to you? Wow, yeah, that is going to do. That's a deep one. Need, to, need some time to think about this. <laughs> um, it's, a, I mean, it's kind of a lifestyle to me, I'd say, especially considering this is something that I loved way before I, it turned into a job. And I think sometimes, ironically, uh, when people say, you know, if you, you do your job, like you never work a day, or sorry, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And I, there definitely is truth in that, but like anything, nothing's perfect when you do it every yeah. day, right? So, yeah. but yeah, it's, I think the creativity side of it is the most important thing, the satisfaction of mm. putting time in something and creating something and getting that like pleasure from looking at it and knowing that it's been a challenge to bring all those things together. And yeah, um, yeah. so I, it's a way of being creative, a way of expressing myself. And the yeah. um, reason I asked is because, just last weekend, I went out to take some photos. I had done it for ages. And I was feeling just like, oh, you know, work and work, and too much work and too much going on. And obviously with all this COVID stuff. Mm. So I went out, went up to the uh, Tate Britain to look at artwork yeah. and take photographs. And I, it was just amazing. And it made me realize what photography actually is Why to you. you. Yeah. yeah, it just keeps you sane and on, on a level on a level line yeah. you know what I mean uh, it's easy to lose touch with that when you do it for work I think and occasionally and that was what all the ways the travel work was for me it was making sure I do what I love and yeah. um, and sometimes when I'm doing the travel work as a job it, it sounds like a dream but it, it introduces these stresses of why is the light bad am I going to deliver for this yes. client or this tourist board like yeah. I can't get a good shot and it, it suddenly takes some of the pleasure away from it right and yeah. so it's easy to because you've got to deliver you're getting paid it's not like you're yeah. you're going out for yourself if you go out for yourself if it goes wrong it goes wrong yeah. isn't it but yeah and I, I don't get me wrong I wouldn't change anything I love doing photography as a job but actually I would do photography well obviously whether I work or whether I don't work in it I'm always going to do that because I love yeah. it yeah. Uh, what is important for me actually for the work I think is being my own boss and being freelance yeah. and being able to do what I want when I want that's the important thing yeah. Um, yeah. but the fact it ties in photography is great yeah. um, but even if I did something else I'd obviously be a photographer anyway and yeah. get the pleasure you know get that creative outlet somewhere so yeah I want to look at another shot now Tom sure. if that's all right I'm just taking a guess now that this is probably going to be one of the most liked ones, possibly, or, or am I wrong? Well, for me, it is. I, um, I thought it was a fantastic shot. In terms of the amount, most amount of likes on a photo, this is maybe above average, but it's not actually. It's surprising sometimes on Instagram yeah. what stuff gets yeah. liked the most. Yeah. Um, but actually, for me, it is actually one of my favourites. I really love it. Yeah. And partly it was like such an amazing experience yeah. being there and doing that. Well, t tell us like where, where you was and sort of how this came about. Wow. Yeah, um, this was out in the Serengeti in Tanzania. Um, we did a little job with the Four Seasons um, Safari Lodge, which is in, which is out there in the middle of nowhere. Right. Uh, and the whole trip was amazing, um, just being on safari and the experience. And the, but we um, reached out to the this hot air ballooning. I think it's called hot air balloon safari. I think or something. And um, we said, and, and this is a way that I mean, I'm, I'm obviously very lucky that I can do this. Um, but being um, known as a photographer, having the following, but also being able to create good photos, I think, gives you a lot of leeway in, in um, negotiating with companies to kind of work with each other and collaborate. Yeah. And um, you've got a trust in you. I'm so. going a bit off off question here, but I think there's a lot of negativity around influencers, which is technically what I am yeah. asking for stuff for free. Yes. Um, in the news, it's always coming up, always seeing stories yes. of this fashion influencer yeah. asking for a free dinner. How dare they? Yeah. And, but you know, it's all about a trade. It's it's the same as anything else. It might. So you know, we said, would you be willing to let us go up in the hot air balloons free, and we'll provide you with photos, and we'll tag you, and you know, yeah. promote you on our Instagram. And so it's a great deal for them too, because obviously they're getting a lot of people interested yeah. in. But yeah, so um, they were like, yep, great, we're happy to take you and your friend up um, if you provide us with a few shots and you post a photo on Instagram. So yeah. um, we went up at like, we had to leave at three o'clock in the morning in the pitch black and we were driving for like two hours to this place where they took off. And I think there was three balloons went up that morning. Yeah. So there's lots of people around. So you're in the third balloon. In another balloon. Yeah. Um, we managed to get a let, like uh, we worked with Nikon and we borrowed a 400 mil um, I think it was yeah, 400 mil and a two to 400 mil lens, which are obviously in, insanely expensive. Which yeah. I don't own one of because yeah. you have to be, I think, a full-time sports or landscape yeah. um, 
wildlife photographer to justify the cost yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, but that was taken on a 400 mil lens from a moving balloon, so yeah. it was tricky. Uh, but we balanced it on the side and we were sort of playing around and everything came together in the shot. So I obviously took thousands and yeah. we saw various animals from above, like the giraffes and um, lions and hippos. But yeah. this one, something about it all came together, the flame in the balloon, the kind yeah. of... The giraffe, the... Yeah, the kind of, yeah, and there's quite a few, I don't actually know if it is in this one where, oh yeah, you can, you can see like this little, um, truck, safari yeah. truck in the distance, there's a road coming through the middle yeah. and it's kind of, I've actually got this one blown up on the wall in my lounge and when you look into the detail on it and see what's yeah. going on, yeah. but it, it the, the light, I was, I was really disappointed in the morning because I was hoping for a nice sunrise and as you can see it was grey, generally that's my my best friend is a nice light and the, you know, amazing kind of sunrise and sunsets. Yeah. But it just, I think this worked much better on this yeah. occasion, like yeah. that kind of painted feel, the grey it, it, sky. That's what it looks, it does look very painterly, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. it, look, it, it looks like there's some kind of filter over the top or is it just to do with the lighting of the day? You know, like a, a, I don't know, like a preset, you know what I mean? That's yeah. what I, I actually never use presets and I, I don't play around huge amounts with each individual colour, a little mm. bit of balancing, but more so I play around balancing with like the white balance and the tint and just yes. kind of, uh, mm. and sometimes I'll play around with the white balance and kind of mask it off. So I might want to make the grass look a bit warmer or, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't generally pick all the individual colours like you can in like Rimmel Photoshop yeah. and add different colours into that. Yeah. But yeah, I, so there's no preset over it and I know what you mean, it does look like something, like a filter's been added over it. I yeah. think it was just the light. Uh, that kind of perfect soft light yeah. um, with that kind of washed yeah. out kind of grey painted sky and, and the, the greens as well. I think because it wasn't sunny, the, the, uh, the colours of the, the trees and the grass and that just, I don't know, it kind of worked really well together, doesn't it? I'm glad I picked one that, that, you, uh, that you like yourself, yeah. um, or you would like them all obviously, but you know what I mean, one of your favourites. Um, now, we'll look at some more pictures in a minute. Yeah. What I want to know is, let's, let's, let's go back before this COVID mm -hmm. malarkey. What did a week in the life of Tom Archer look like, you know, as a pro photographer? And this is obviously for our audience, like what does a week in, uh, in the life of a pro photographer like yourself, what does it look like? I think it's an interesting question. I think it's something that I would have wondered when I started out, because yeah. it's something maybe people don't talk about, but you're like, well, how does that actually, you know, yeah. what is the job like? Yeah. Um, it's also a hard question to answer because every week's so different. I don't have a typical day. Mm. Um, How about like a month then or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I think like you spend so much more time in the office, like my office just at home yeah. than people think. I know that for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, how much of the day as a photographer is actually shooting? Like yeah. it depends on what you do, I guess, and, and who you, if you have people employed. But I do find I spend a lot of time yeah. uh, either emails or meetings or, you know, all the kind of stuff, the admin stuff on yeah. the back end. Yeah. Um, a fair amount of time editing, and then obviously I have uh, my trips, yeah. where it's completely different and I'm away for a week or a few days working with like a tourist board or a brand and traveling somewhere and it's intense. It's like up at four in the morning, hike up to the top of the mountain, get these shots and out all day, out at, sunri at sunset, sorry, and out at night and it's quite draining, but also really enjoyable. And yeah. uh, um, and then yeah, back home, back in the office. And, but it, it really depends as well, because in the summer I still do a few weddings. So on a Saturday I'll be out shooting a wedding and uh, I really enjoy them too. I think that they're, uh, they're the best clients you can work with, wedding clients. They're just, everyone's, everyone's so happy and uh, anything you I mean, yeah, you, I mean, <laughs> you know what it's like working with some commercial clients, like a lot are great and you have a great relationship, but they're a lot more demanding and, and less likely to be pleased like yeah, you have I to be so, yeah. I've, like, I never have a negative word about weddings everyone's always so happy and pleased with everything you do and yeah. uh, obviously everyone you meet on the day so yeah. everyone's in a good yeah. mood they've had a few drinks yeah and I, I, they enjoy that and I, so I enjoy that day and I really enjoy going through them as well after because yeah. you know for me a wedding's about capturing the emotion so it's like every photo is laughter and fun yeah. and um, so going through them kind of evokes that so I'll spend a day in the office going through them and I just Thanks, puts me in a good mood, you know, yeah, so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I actually own a, a photography studio with two other guys as well, and that probably takes up quite a lot of my time now in between. Um, so we do commercial photography and videography. We do a lot of product work in the studio. Um, and then, yeah, so a lot of it is like reaching out for meetings and marketing yeah. and, and the c general yeah. running the business. So it's such a mixture, my, my days and my weeks. It's yeah. a blend of all these different things. And I really like that and the, the variety I like. You know, I don't always love every part of it. I don't like yeah. doing emails. I don't think anyone really does, yeah. but 
it's a part of business and you know you take the rough of the smooth i guess yeah so thanks for that. so that that's that's before the covid yeah how is this covid situation affecting you like uh, as a photographer you know because i'm sure that there's people out there that will probably sympathize with with us <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of people, a lot of photographers have been really badly affected by this, obviously, because it's made it really hard. And I've been relatively lucky because I started the new studios and we were able to do product photography. Right. We had a lot of clients reaching out and, and posting us products and doing it in the studio. Now, yeah. um, it's, the studio is actually along, it's actually the other side of London. So yeah. uh, I'm mostly working uh, remotely, just doing sort of meetings and calls and the occasional shoot at home. But um, so there's three of us and one of us is the main photographer and does all the product work. So right. um, it's very different to my other stuff. But yeah, without that, I would be in real trouble because obviously zero travel work, yeah. which was a big part of my work. Um, zero weddings have all been cancelled yeah. uh, and now pretty much all of my commercial work unless it's linked to travel or or, or my instagram um all my commercial work now goes through the new studio yeah um but we haven't been able to do obviously for quite a few months any kind of shoots on location mm -hmm. uh, we could only do stuff in the studio without people i mean it's changed a bit now yeah. um but yeah I'm, we're very lucky that we had enough to keep us going and yeah. kind of pay the bills for now yeah, um, but I really empathise with people that uh, yeah. are very, you know, specialised and only do weddings or only do yeah. travel that they've, yeah, been in real trouble and yeah. um, I think they're just doing anything they can to kind of bring money in, whether it's trying to yeah. teach like you do and yeah. a lot of people starting up doing tutorials and lessons and trying yeah. to, um, but yeah, I think a lot of people are trying to play the waiting game really and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough for us all and... Um, it's just like hanging in there, isn't it? Mm. You've got to just hang in there. I think we're all, we're all feeling it. But uh, yeah. but yeah, no, so hopefully people can sympathise. We're all in the same boat, aren't yeah. we? Right, another picture yeah. time. But this time, you choose. I mean, okay. So choose one that's important to you or yeah. your favourite one or whatever and, and tell us about it, all right? Okay, I think I'd like to choose this one, which is... Um, of a glowworm cave in mm -hmm. New Zealand. And it was a particularly difficult shot to get, so I think it might be interesting to talk about it. Yeah. So this was, uh, my wife and I were traveling around New Zealand for six weeks, so it wasn't a work, it was just a kind of a pleasure trip. Yeah. And um, I knew I wanted to go and photograph glowworms, so I'd seen pictures of them. Yeah. But I hadn't seen a lot of great pictures of them, and I thought, well, they're probably going to be hard. So um, just, so what, we say glow, what, they stuck to the ceiling or something? Like, yeah, how does it they're, work? They're um, like larvae of, lar right. larvae, larvae? Larvae, yeah. <laughs> Of these little uh, flies, I think, from right. what I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously when the lights are on, you can't see much. It's like a bit of a, like, gloopy, like, dropping from, the, like, in a line. And, and I think they light up to attract other flies to fly in and they get stuck a bit like a spider would okay. and they eat they them. Eat don't them, yeah. don't uh, yeah. hold me on all this. This is what I'm remembering. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, the, in New Zealand, in these caves, you, you get these sorts of... Again, I don't know what the right word for it. It's swarms yeah. of them that are all stuck to the ceiling. Mm. But it has to be, obviously, really pitch black to be able to see them. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I was determined to go and photograph them. And, I, again, it's a challenging thing even just to be able to get the opportunity to do it. So the main glowworm caves, which is in a place called Waitomo in the North Island of New Zealand, are so touristy. I think the main Waitomo caves has 3,000 people a day go through it. Right. And you get on a boat and you kind of they row you through, but no lights, no photography because everyone would be flashing and blinding everyone. And yes. So this was actually a, a family run, uh, it's called Glowing Adventures. It was like a family farm and they'd found these glowworms and you had to, it was quite adventurous to get in there. Yeah. Um, you had to like clamber over all these rocks and wade through mm. this stream like you can see there. Yeah. Um, but I said to the, again, I reached out and said, I'd love to photograph them. I'll provide you with some hopefully great photos yeah, yeah. Um, if you'll let us come in. And they said, yeah, fine, uh, yeah. we'd be happy to do that. So the, the benefits of having a big uh, Instagram. It's very lucky, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, and the owner kind of took us in there, my wife and I, and he came in um, with one of their workers as well. And we went in there and he was like, look, you've got a couple of hours, um, do what you want basically. And yeah. I think that made such a huge difference to the experience as well, like not having to be rushed through with loads of people. Yeah. So at first just kind of went in, paused yeah. and looked and it, it is incredible. Like there's nothing quite like it as your eyes really adjust to the dark. Yeah. Um, it's like seeing the Milky Way and the, yeah. the picture doesn't really do it justice, like how impressive it is. But anyway, I, I knew I wanted to, I'd seen a lot of pictures of them um, on their own, but I wanted to try and 
get it in a scene where you saw a person and kind of felt yourself in that scene, if you know what I mean? Yeah. Because if you just see them on their own, as yeah. cool as they look, you can't really, it doesn't mean anything unless no, you've been there. It, it, you're right, it, it gives a sense of scale and, yeah. and things like that. I've noticed that actually with a lot of your pictures, there's something in there, like there's a giraffe in the, yeah. in the other one and there's the person in the uh, Dubai shot. Um, and that's, is that something, well obviously it's something purposely that you do, but sometimes with landscape photographers it's very clear, isn't it? Like it's this big open vast mm -hmm. space, but very often you place someone in, in it, don't yeah. you? Yeah, Yeah, I do it purposely. I like either a person or a building or a, an animal to yeah. show scale, because I do think something, you know, a scene can look amazing to your eyes, but yeah. you take a picture of it and you're like, well, it's beautiful, but you can't see how epic it is, if you yeah. know what I mean. You can't see the... So I think scale's important, and if I can, some kind of action maybe where there's something moving or yeah. um, maybe that less so because it's harder to get. But, um, yeah. yeah, so with this one, I knew that... So I asked my wife, who's very patient with me, because it was so dark, I was having to do five-minute exposures oh, to get wow. this. She stood standing still for five minutes. Well, <laughs> what I did was I had... She had a head torch, so that all of that light... Um, in front of her is just from a head torch. Oh, it looks yeah. kind of like it's yeah, a light yeah, it coming through a hole or something, it does, but yeah. uh, it's just a head torch. So because that was so bright compared to the gloves, it was like she was turning it on, mm. standing still, I think, for about 30 seconds and then turning it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, it, yeah, we created the shape and then it was allowing the rest of it to expose. So it was quite a technical thing. I had to take a lot yeah. and play around after to kind of balance them. Yes. So I think that's maybe why I chose this because it was hard work trying to bring everything yeah. together and I hadn't really seen people that had done it with a person yeah. in it, not well. So it's a five minute exposure yeah. with like a 30 second torch burst in the yeah. background. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, blending it together. So. Yeah. That's really um, cool. But yeah, it was just a particularly kind of quite a magical experience yeah, and felt quite adventurous. Yeah, so. and, I, and I bet the, the owners of uh, of this place, I bet they were absolutely uh, thrilled with yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I think they were using it as like the one of the main image on their website yeah. and yeah. yeah. So this is the last question, yeah. Tom. <laughs> this is the last question. I've had a fantastic chat with you, and uh, again, thanks for coming. Um, but I've got this. This is the question I've got for you, right? I want you to imagine that you are back. Go back in time to yourself mm -hmm. before you had any Instagram followers, before you had any uh, jobs or any money that you'd earned from photography. What are you gonna? What are you gonna say to yourself that's gonna put you in this position now? quicker. Do you understand what I say? Give yeah. yourself, so go back in time and say to yourself, right, you've got to do this, 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 and you will get here much yeah. quicker. Wow. It's, it's a good one. It's it? a good one, yeah. I mean, I have to say, I, I don't think there's a huge amount because it, it is a hustle and it's a, a graph to, to learn photography. I don't think you can necessarily, except for putting more hours in, necessarily become better at photography really quickly, except no. for just putting the, yeah, there's no, no shortcut to it. No, there um, isn't. Not to, no, there isn't. Except there. for finding maybe a good teacher at the start, uh, yeah, which maybe where you come in for people. Yes, <laughs> that's, def that's definitely what people yeah. need to do. Yeah. But having said that, from uh, my social media, from my Instagram following, there, there is a lot I could have done there. Yeah. And I would have told myself something different with that. Because, I, you know, when I started out as photography, I had my Instagram page, which was a bit of everything at first and I only slowly morphed into the travel and landscapes because it's what I really loved yeah. um, but I had a similar I mean not quite as good but a similarish caliber of photos for years with less than a thousand followers it yeah. didn't and uh, it isn't just about the photography I know we briefly yeah. had touched on that earlier it's about how you market yourself and how to um, and I don't think I understood that. I was like, you know, I think my photos are good. Why, why haven't I got followers? Yeah. But I wasn't doing anything. I was like, I'm hashtagging stuff. But it's, it's about so much more than that. Yeah. Um, there's so many things that you have to do for your Instagram to grow. And it's a bit inexplicable, as we said as well. It's like algorithms and no one really knows. Yeah. But you definitely have to put the effort in. And I think if I had have known in the early days of Instagram when it was much easier to grow, like it's very hard now to yeah. get a big following from nothing yeah. unless you yeah, hugely stand out and you do something truly unique. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in the early days, I feel like I wasted it. I was just posting the occasional photos, whereas now I'd go back and say, hustle. Because if you had started out, and I know people that um, yeah, did very well at the beginning, and they had like feature pages, yeah. and I know people with millions of followers that, yeah. uh, that don't necessarily have amazing photography. It's good, yeah. like it's, but yeah, it's about starting out early and um, really putting the effort in, in the early days before people, you know, what, got into it. What do you mean by like, what do you mean by hustle? Like, what, how, how would, what would you say to yourself to get your, get these followers? Like, well, okay, it's hard to know now because things are different, but like yeah. I said, back then, some of the most important things I think were 
posting regularly, yeah. and I mean, this is probably pre-stories as well, actually, I think, because yeah. stories can be powerful now, but uh, posting regularly and consistently, yeah. not just writing, this is a landscape, you know, like engaging with followers, making, like getting people to comment and, and getting people to be interested, yeah. um, replying to everyone, yeah. which I always tried to do, but it's really important. Like yeah. if people are taking the time to comment and liking it, you know, comment back, ask them questions, get them engaged with you. Um, and, but what I found really powerful at the beginning was um, finding people I really respected that had big accounts and liked their work. So it, d it was done in an honest way, but yeah. going out and every day commenting on dozens of different photographers uh, and, and talking honestly, like there's bots that do this now, you know, yes. that just comment well, on, that's, but it's yeah. doing it honestly, like finding a big photographer. So I think the first, when I first realized I could do this, I think there was a photographer, I can't actually remember who it was, but. Um, he had hundreds of thousands of followers and I started commenting his photos. I really love it and you're inspiring me. And he followed me back and I was like, wow, I'm nobody. And this yeah. guy's followed me and he's got, um, so maybe my work is good and maybe yeah. like maybe, and then slowly I started to do that more and more and more followed me. And that was when my account really started growing. And I think yeah. it was Instagram saying, this guy's got kudos because lots of bigger follow, like bigger yeah, yeah. accounts are following. Because you're dealing with a computer at the end of the day, aren't you? Yeah, so, they've got to try and judge how, yeah. you know, so. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things you can do like that, a lot yeah. of bits and pieces, and, and reaching out to like um, feature pages that feature your account, anything that would like... Like, like magazines, you mean, or blog sites? And... Uh, well, uh, there's a lot of like... Um, so for example, in the, in the early days, I, when I first started taking off, I reached out to like EarthPix. Have you heard of EarthPix? Right, okay. Earth Focus, Earth... Oh, you're cool. talking about big Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. Um, and for example, EarthPix was, I think it is the biggest thing. It's over 15 okay. million right. followers, yeah. and all they do is post travel landscape photography yeah, yeah, yeah. and they posted a photo and I think I got a thousand followers in an hour right, yeah. um, so things like that like they wouldn't necessarily just find you because there's so many people out there but if you reach out a lot of them will ignore you because they get hassled every yeah, day right, but yeah. if you can stand out tag them in your photos approach them yeah. it can like really bump you up but whereas now it's it is hard there's too much competition yeah. still try you know yeah. but yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah that would have been my advice back in the day is like yeah. start getting into that hustle and trying really hard early on and, and the okay. importance of social media, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, ha yeah. Well, yeah. stepping back and realizing, yeah, yeah, what that can do to boost your career. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Tom, it's been fantastic to talk to you. I, I've sincerely enjoyed it. I really have. Your work is fantastic. Do not forget to check Tom out. He's also got a YouTube channel as well. Uh, Instagram, obviously. I will put it all in the description of this video. Um, we can't shake hands, Tom, no. but we can do We that. can do an elbow, yeah. Thanks again for having me in, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure for us as well. So, uh, thank you, and uh, yeah, oh, do the normal subscribing and liking and commenting, you know what you need to do. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time.